Long before anyone spoke of Europe or nations or borders, the continent was already a crossroads. Climate shifted. Ice sheets advanced and retreated. Landscapes opened and closed like doors. And through these doors, small human groups moved. Step by step, generation by generation. Archaeologists usually begin this story in Africa because that is where Homo sapiens emerged. From there, small bands traveled into the Near East, carrying stone tools, language, and the ability to adapt. Europe was still a cold frontier, but it was not empty. Other humans already lived there, including the Neanderthals. When modern humans entered Europe, something important happened. DNA studies show mixing between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. This left a small genetic signature in almost every modern European today, not as a myth, but as measurable fragments in the genome. Yet this was only the first layer. The earliest Europeans were hunter-gatherers. They lived in small mobile groups. They followed rivers, forests, and migrating animals. The Balkans played a critical role here. It acted as a gateway. The terrain stretched between Anatolia and Central Europe, a natural corridor. Many of the earliest migrations passed through it. As the Ice Age weakened, Europe changed. Forests spread, coastlines shifted, populations slowly increased. Geneticists identified distinct groups among these early hunter-gatherers. Western hunter-gatherers, Eastern hunter-gatherers, and southern populations in regions like the Balkans. These groups were not nations. They did not see themselves as Europeans, but they formed the biological foundation of Europe's later populations. Their DNA still lives in modern people, especially in mountainous or rural regions where later mixing was limited. And while we follow this story through genetics, we must always remember something else. DNA is not identity. It is history written in molecules. Archaeology adds another layer. Tools changed. Burial customs changed. Art appeared. Cave paintings. Carvings. Simple symbols. These shifts reveal something deeper. Before we continue, thank you for watching this far. It honestly means a lot. I wanted to take just a few seconds to tell you that we now have our own membership community here on the channel. If you enjoy these deep dives into Balkan and Albanian history, if you feel proud seeing our stories told properly, and if you want to support the channel directly, you can join our members by clicking the button below. Members get early access to videos, behind the scenes posts, exclusive polls where you help choose future topics, and for the higher tiers, your name even appears at the end of every documentary. It's completely optional, but it helps me invest more time, more research, and bring you even better content. Let's get back to our story. Human imagination was taking root across the continent, and the Balkans remained one of the key bridges where ideas, people, and genes moved together. From here, the story does not stop. It evolves because the next great transformation was already forming far to the southeast. Agriculture, villages, the first farmers. And once again, the Balkans would stand at the center of Europe's unfolding story. Agriculture did not begin in Europe. It began further east, in regions of Anatolia and the Near East, where wild wheat and barley already grew. There, communities learned to plant, harvest, store, and plan for the future. This changed everything. Food no longer depended only on hunting and gathering. Villages appeared, permanent homes, pottery, storage pits, social roles, and population growth. From these early farming societies, people began to move, slowly, family by family, valley by valley, and once again, the Balkans became the first doorway into Europe. 
Archaeology shows some of the earliest European farming cultures here. Names like Starchevo, Kuros, and Vincha appear in the record. Tools changed, pottery styles spread, fields were cleared, forests opened. These were not invaders in the modern sense. More often, small groups brought a way of life that gradually expanded across landscapes. Genetics confirms this movement. The DNA of these first European farmers shows clear connections to Neolithic Anatolia. They mixed with local hunter-gatherers. But at first, farming ancestry often dominated. In many regions, the population structure shifted toward these new arrivals. This was not a single moment. It was a long process across centuries, sometimes cooperation, sometimes isolation, sometimes gradual cultural absorption. The Balkans hold a special place in this pattern. Here, the earliest and densest farming settlements in Europe formed. Rich soil and river valleys supported larger populations. The famous Vincha culture left traces of organized settlements and symbolic artifacts. Some scholars describe these as among the first proto-urban communities in Europe. Meanwhile, hunter-gatherer groups did not disappear. They continued to exist in forests, mountains, and northern regions. Over time, intermarriage increased. Genetic studies show a gradual return of hunter-gatherer DNA into farming populations after an initial decline. Evidence suggests social and demographic blending instead of one culture simply replacing another. This period also shaped biology. Diets rich in grains altered health patterns. Skeletons show different stress markers compared to mobile hunter-gatherers. Most people still lacked the ability to digest lactose in adulthood. That adaptation would become important later. Trade networks grew. Obsidian, shells, and crafted goods moved across regions. Again, the Balkans acted as a central corridor that linked the Aegean and Anatolia to Central and Western Europe. And while farming spread, language families likely shifted too. There is still debate about when Indo-European languages entered Europe. The strongest genetic and linguistic evidence points not to these farmers, but to a later migration from the steppe a movement that would reshape the continent again. It did not erase what came before. It layered itself on top of hunter-gatherers and early farmers. And as we move toward that phase of the story, the Balkans again stand in a critical position. A meeting place, a cultural hinge, a genetic bridge. So as the Neolithic villages thrived and expanded, a new force was already forming on the distant grasslands to the northeast mobile pastoralists, horse cultures, wide open horizons, and their arrival would mark the next major chapter in the story of the first Europeans. While Neolithic villages were spreading across river valleys and fertile plains, something very different was evolving far to the northeast. On the open steppes north of the Black Sea, communities learned to live with vast distances, herding livestock across seasonal pastures. Mobility shaped their world. Horses were not simply animals. They were extensions of movement, power, and connection. Carts, wagons, and eventually horseback riding created a level of mobility never seen before in Europe. Archaeologists often associate these groups with what is called the Yamnaya horizon. And both archaeology and genetics agree. Around 5,000 years ago, they began moving into Europe. This movement was not a single invasion. It was a long process across multiple directions and centuries. But genetically, it left a deep mark. Ancient DNA studies show that in many parts of Europe, a significant portion of ancestry shifted towards steppe-related populations. New burial styles appeared. Tumuli, Kurgans, single burials with red ochre and distinctive grave goods. Social structures seem to have changed as well, becoming more hierarchical and possibly more male line focused. Linguists connect these steppe cultures with the spread of Indo-European languages, which today form the largest language family in Europe. Again, 
This was not the replacement of one people by another. It was a fusion that layered new identities on top of older ones. And once again, the Balkans stood in the middle of this process. The steppe ancestry did not simply sweep across Central and Western Europe. It first interacted with the populations of Southeastern Europe, where hunter-gatherer, early farmer, and local traditions were already deeply rooted. In some regions, gene flow was gradual and reciprocal. In others, steppe-related ancestry rose sharply in a short period. Burial customs mixed. Material culture blended. Over time, the genetic landscape of Europe stabilized into something new, a three-part foundation of Ice Age hunter-gatherers, early Anatolian farmers, and steppe pastoralists. This mixture also reshaped how societies functioned. Pastoral mobility paired with settled agriculture created complex economies. Metalworking expanded. Trade networks stretched from the Aegean to the Baltic. Myths of sky gods, thunder wielders, and heroic warriors may echo world views that formed during this period, though myth cannot be traced genetically with certainty. What can be measured is population structure. In many modern Europeans, a large fraction of ancestry ultimately traces back to these steppe migrations layered upon earlier populations. And again, the Balkans were not just a highway, they were a mixing ground, a zone where cultures negotiated space, identity and survival. In mountain valleys, coastal plains and river corridors, communities blended. Not smoothly, not uniformly, but persistently. This is why simple claims about who came first in the Balkans rarely hold up under scientific scrutiny. Every phase brought continuity and change at the same time. As the Bronze Age unfolded from this fusion, Europe entered a world of fortified settlements, expanding trade and rising regional identities. The seeds of later cultures, Illyrian groups, Thracians, Greek-speaking communities, Italic societies, Celts, all developed within this layered genetic and cultural foundation. And the Balkans continued to be at the center of it, shaping and being shaped by the waves of human movement that defined the continent. But the story does not stop in prehistory, because over thousands of years, migration never disappeared. Empires rose, peoples moved, languages shifted. And the question of who the first Europeans were only becomes more complicated as history moves forward. So to understand the modern picture and the place of the Balkans within it, we need to follow that timeline into the Iron Age, the classical world and beyond. As Europe moved into the Iron Age and then into the classical world, the genetic foundation laid in prehistory continued to echo beneath the surface of new languages, states and religions. Illyrian-speaking groups in the Western Balkans, Thracian communities in the East, early Greek-speaking societies in the South, and many others emerged within that same blended ancestry of hunter-gatherers, early farmers, and steppe pastoralists. What changed most was not the biology, but the stories people told about themselves. Cities formed. Writing appeared. Myth and memory became anchored to places and heroes. Yet when scientists examine DNA from Iron Age burials across the Balkans, they often see strong continuity with earlier Bronze Age populations. In other words, people changed culturally far more rapidly than they changed genetically. This is important because today, discussions about origin in the Balkans often become emotional. Claims are made about who was original, who migrated later, who belongs more deeply to the land. But genetics shows something more complex and more interesting. Modern Balkan populations generally descend from the same ancient components as the rest of Europe. Yet the ratio of those components and the strength of local continuity are unusually high here. Mountain landscapes, tight-knit communities and periods of isolation allowed older genetic layers to persist. And in several studies, 
Albanians in particular often appear as one of the populations showing some of the strongest genetic continuity with ancient Balkan groups, even when languages and political structures changed over millennia. This does not make modern Albanians more ancient than everyone else, but it does suggest a remarkable thread of persistence running through time. History, of course, did not stand still. The Roman Empire arrived, knitting the Balkans into a vast Mediterranean world. Later, Slavic-speaking populations moved south into the region, blending with locals rather than replacing them. The Byzantine world layered Christianity, administration and trade networks on top of older cultural landscapes. The Ottomans later added yet another chapter. Through all of this, people married, migrated, fought, traded and adapted. Genetic profiles shifted gradually, not in clean breaks. And again, the Balkans acted as both a crossroads and a container, a place where new influences entered, but where older threads never fully disappeared. So when asking who were the first Europeans, the answer is not a single tribe or language. It is a tapestry of groups stretching back tens of thousands of years. Ice Age hunter-gatherers clinging to survival, early farmers reshaping the land, steppe herders introducing mobility and new traditions, and countless local cultures weaving these strands together. And the role of the Balkans? It was the stage where these worlds repeatedly met. A gateway, a refuge, and in many ways, a genetic and cultural archive of Europe's deepest past. In the end, identity in the Balkans is not something invented yesterday, nor is it frozen in antiquity. It is layered, like the soil of an archaeological site, each layer telling part of the story. Modern Albanians, Greeks, Vlachs, Slavic-speaking communities, and many others all inherit pieces of that long journey. But the data increasingly shows that the roots of the Western Balkans run exceptionally deep with some lineages surviving here from the earliest chapters of European prehistory. And maybe that is the real story, not competition over who was first, but the recognition that this region preserved the memory, genetic and cultural, of what Europe has been since the beginning. If you want to support the channel even more, memberships are available in the description below. Thank you to all of you who helped this channel grow.